Um, and I've said several times already, I mean, we have this definition of the derivative. It's the limit as H approaches zero of F of X plus H minus F of X or divided by H. But actually doing anything with this definition is always a fight. I mean, you have to try to take this limit. You can never use continuity because if you just let H be zero, you always get the division by zero error. You can never use the quotient rule for the same reason. So whether you can take this limit at all, or at least without a huge amount of effort, is sort of up in the air. I mean, you'll have noticed probably that we keep hitting these quadratic examples, and that's because those are practically the only examples where this works out nice, and you can just use this definition. So we need a better way of finding derivatives, and that's what we're going to start getting in section 3.3. And let me start by looking at maybe the most boring functions out there. But to being boring doesn't mean they're not important. The derivative of a constant function, f of x equals k. So this function has as its graph just a horizontal line. And now let's try to figure out the derivative. And let's just reason this thing through. The derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. A constant function, by its nature, is a function that isn't changing. It's this number k forever. So the rate of change of a function that isn't changing is zero. So there's our first, I must have used this word before, but the, the process of taking a derivative is differentiation. This is our first differentiation rule. We can look at a function like that and we can just take its derivative and we don't have to mess around with limits and f's of x plus h. And we're now from these humble beginnings, we're going to build up a list of rules, derivatives that we can just take without any reference to the f of x plus h definition. So this class is going to kind of be a list. I'll try not to go too fast through these. 
The next function I'd like to look at is f of x equals x. In, in fact, let's, let's be a little more ambitious. Let's look at f of x equals k times x, where k is some constant. Again, this derivative we can sort of work our way through, I think. Um, in the sense that this f of x is linear, and linear functions are distinguished by having constant rates of shade. The slope of a linear function is the constant rate of shade of the linear function. So again, just kind of trying to think this through intuitively without referring to the limit definition. If the derivative is the rate of change of the function, and the rate of change of this function is always k. Then the rate of change is k. Let me And as a special case of this, the function that I put down on the board and then modified, f of x equals x. Well, you can think of having an x as having a one x, multiplication by one, doesn't do anything. So the derivative of this function is one. And that's it, probably as far as, not it as far as derivatives go, but that's probably it as far as the really intuitive derivatives go. From now on, I'm just going to be putting formulas on the board, and we're not going to prove these formulas. We couldn't without a huge amount of effort. We're just going to have to kind of trust that as your professor, I am not lying to you about these things. We're going to learn the power rule next. Say we have x raised to a power, and that could be any power. n could be positive, n could be negative, n could be an ugly fraction or an ugly decimal, n could be a fraction, but f of x equals x to the n. The power rule says, that the derivative of this is gotten by taking that n, bringing it down in front of, that's a pretty big, I guess it's not doing any harm, taking that n, bringing it down in front <coughs> of the variable, and then in the power, we're going to subtract one. 
And that's how we differentiate a power. And let's spend some time on this power. I mean, it takes a few seconds to write it down, but we really need to master this and get it into our long-term memory for the rest of the course. Let's start with a sort of clean example. F of X equals X cubed. And suppose we want the derivative of this. Well, flipping back and forth between this frame and the previous frame, um, that three, that power should come down in front of the X. So we should have a three, then we should have our X. And then this power should have a one subtracted from it. So our power in the derivative is three minus one. And our derivative is three X squared. And I'm not proving the power rule, but let's at least try to convince ourselves that this is true. This derivative should be the slope of the tangent line, remember? The instantaneous rate of change and the slope of the tangent line are the same thing. So let's expand this example. Let's find the line. Tangent to F of X equals X cubed at the point two, comma eight. And then we'll go to Desmos and we'll graph X cubed and we'll graph the tangent line. And we'll at least try to convince ourselves that, that this looks plausible, that this rule, which we maybe don't really understand, does seem to be giving us the right answer. So to find a line, we need a scope and we need a point. And we have all that we need to find this line basically on the board already. The slope is the derivative. X is two. So we plug two in the derivative and we get three times two squared 12. And then let's go ahead and use slope point form. Y minus eight equals 12. times X minus two. And let's see if this looks right. Let's go to Desmos. Online students watching the recording aren't at the moment seeing anything. but you will in a moment. 
So I'm putting up X cubed. I'm putting up the point we're interested <coughs> in. And now let me share this thing. Here's the point, ah, couldn't see it, but there's the point two eight. And I'm claiming that the tangent line is y minus eight equals 12 times x minus two. And the tangent line is supposed to be the line that just brushes against the curve and gives the derivative of the curve at the point. And that is what we're seeing here. Um, we're going to get to this much later in the course, but if you zoom in on a point, its curve should look like the tangent line. So the fact that this green curve we're looking at and this red curve, x cubed, the fact that these look identical when we zoom in and look at the point suggests to us that the screen line really is the tangent line. So we might not understand where this 3x squared is coming from. You you need to you need to use the binomial theorem to prove that it's not very interesting. Um, but whether we sort of understand it or not, it does seem to be giving us the correct slope because this is the tangent line of that curve. We can continue to do examples with the varying levels of complexity. I've said that this formula works no matter what n is, whether n's nice or n some ugly fraction or whatever. So let's say we've been using F a lot. Let's switch things up. Let's say that G of X equals X to the one seventh power. And let's say we want the derivative of G of X. Well, according to this rule we have, we should take this power and bring it down in front of the X. So we should have one seventh times X. And then we should subtract one in the power. One seventh minus one is negative six sevenths. So here's the derivative. This gives um, the instantaneous rate of change. This gives the slope of the tangent line. I mean, those are the same thing, but there are sort of different ways of talking about the same thing. Let me point out here that having a negative power is the same as having a positive power in the denominator of a fraction. If you've forgotten that little rule, you should refresh yourself because it's going to come up a fair amount in the early parts of this course. 
I mean, I say early parts were a fourth of the way done already, if you can believe that. But negative power turns into a fraction. Let's take this rule and let's look at a very similar example and let's relate it back to something we said Thursday, it must have been. So we were talking Thursday about the fact that a derivative might not have to exist. That is a function could be defined, but the derivative could still not exist. And we gave some examples. We said that derivatives don't exist at corners. And we said derivatives don't exist at points of discontinuity. And then we also said that derivatives don't exist if the tangent line is vertical, because vertical lines don't have slopes. The rise over the run formula gives you a division by zero error. And I said that an explicit example of that is f of x equals x to the one third power. Although I'm not sure if I explicitly, well, I might have said the cubed root of x in Thursday's lecture, I don't recall. This just like that negative power thing, this is another sort of thing you need to know that a root, the nth root of x is the same as a power. The nth root of x is x to the one over n power. So the cubed root of x is the same as x to the one third power. And I therefore Thursday made this claim that the derivative, see how we're switching to Leibniz notation. I made the claim that the derivative of x to the one third does not exist when x equals zero. And now we can check that. We can take the derivative of x to the one third, and we can see what happens when x equals zero. Again, the Leibniz notation is convenient or when you want to make statements, like I want to make a statement about x to the one third, I don't want to give that cubed root a name, I just want to talk about it. The derivative of x to the one third, according to our power rule, is one third times x, to the one third minus one power. So one third times x to the negative two thirds power.
And now, once again, I said that this was going to keep coming up. We're going to rewrite negative powers. And that, that's, I feel, a pretty normal thing to do in math. Having a negative power is the same as having a positive power in the denominator of a fraction. And I've claimed that this isn't defined at x equals zero. This derivative isn't defined. And the fact that the derivative isn't defined at x equals zero just falls directly out of the power rule. If we let x be zero, zero to the one third to the two thirds is zero. And we get a division by zero error. So what I said Thursday, what I sort of tried to make a graphical argument that the tangent line does look vertical, but now we can just see it algebraically. This derivative isn't defined at zero because we get a division by zero error. Any questions so far about this quotient rule? Quotient rule um, about this power rule. Let's. I feel like a lot of calculus students end up just kind of memorizing this derivative. It's not that you have to memorize it, it's just that it shows up so often that eventually it finds its way into people's memory. Let's take the derivative of the square root. Let's learn how to find the instantaneous rate of change, which is also the slope of the tangent line. And we can do this because square roots are actually powers. Even if we don't write them this way, the square root of x is x to the one half power. And if we have a power, we can differentiate it. This one half goes down. And then in this power, we subtract one. And I, again, I would encourage you to rewrite to negative powers. This negative power especially, I don't, I would not uh, leave my answer like this. I rewrite x to the negative one half. <laughs> as one divided by x to positive one half. And then I would use the fact that x to the positive one half is the square root of x to rewrite this further. Finally,
I would use the fact that when you're multiplying fractions, you just multiply the tops and multiply the bottoms to rewrite this as one divided by two times the square root of x. There our powers. That's how we um let me try that sentence again. We can deal with something like this. Again, using the fact that having a positive power in a fraction is the same as having a negative power in the top. I mean, looking at this thing, we have no conception of how to take the derivative of a quotient. We have something divided by something else. We know how to take the derivative of the top, it's zero. We know how to take the derivative of the bottom, seven x to the sixth. But we have not at this point learned the way to take those rules and put them together. What we could do, if we wanted the derivative of this thing is to remember that one over x to the seventh is x to the negative seventh. And once you sort of made that leap, taking the derivative, becomes an application of the power And again, I would not leave my answer this way. I would rewrite any negative powers as positive powers. And I mean, I think like on the online quizzes and stuff, if I ask you to um, differentiate one over x to the seventh, I mean, these things are multiple choice. And the correct answer would probably be written way. So if you can't go from negative 7x to the negative 8th to this fraction, you would not be able to recognize the correct answer. Why don't, why don't you do something for me? Why don't we find a tangent line? Let's find the line tangent to oh, tangent to one divided by x squared at the point one, comma one. For anyone watching this, I'm uh, going to pause this recording so that my students have time to work. Let me, since people have some sort of answer, some students are still working, which is fine. I mean, if math requires practice. <coughs> this is x to the negative second, f prime of x, is then the negative two comes down, negative two x to the negative third. 
this negative two times minus one is negative three. So negative two over x cubed is the derivative. We're interested in this value of x, x equals one, f prime of one is negative two. And once you found the slope, y minus one is negative two times x minus one. We could, if we were so inclined, rewrite that into slope intersect form. Y minus two equals negative two X. Sorry, we can rewrite it in slope intercept form, but let's not make any weird mistakes along the way. Y minus one equals negative two X plus two. So we've got negative two, negative one. We multiply them the negatives turn into a positive. And hopefully negative two X plus three is the answer. If I haven't done anything absurd here, let's take a look. look at f of x equals one. Um, okay. I've just been kicked out of Zoom. Um, well, we'll, we'll continue. We were looking at at what x we were one, one over, over x squared one over x squared and we were looking at the point one comma one and we said that the derivative was negative two so y minus one equals negative two, x minus one. And this does look like a tangent line. See, it just rushes up against the curve. This is pretty, no idea what's happening. I mean, it says that I'm, screen saving, and this is the Zoom icon. If I go to new share whiteboard, the whiteboard, I don't, I don't know what happened, but, but as far as I know, we're still <coughs> recording. So this does once again, seem to be the answer. We might not know where this power rule comes from, but it seems to be giving us the right solution. The power rule then, I mean, I've lectured on it. We'll say we're done with it, although we're going to keep using it for the rest of the semester. But let's move on to some other piece of material. What we have so far is extremely delicate, by which I mean if we have like x squared and we want to take its derivative, we can do that. It's two times x to the first. 
But if we modify this ever so slightly, if we put a negative sign in front of the x squared, then we no longer have a pure power. And we don't necessarily know how to proceed from here. So let me give you oops, the constant multiple rule. And the constant multiple rule says that if you're taking the derivative of a power times a function, the power, not, not a power, sorry, spent so much time talking about the power rule. If you take the derivative of a constant times a function, then the constant just kind of sits there. You take the derivative of the function and the constant just remains where it is. And this is best illustrated by a quick example. Say we have two times x to the fifth. So we've got this power, which we know how to deal with. And we've got this constant sitting in front of the power. And what this rule is saying is that if we want to differentiate this, that two will just stay put. And now we'll differentiate x to the fifth as usual. The five comes down, the x remains an x in the top, five minus one, turns into four. And now we simplify this a little. We have two times five, 10 times X to the four. So having a power in front of it, for like this third time this period, having a constant in front of a function doesn't really complicate things. You just deal with the function as normal, and then you remember that the constant is there. Um, D of X, equals two times the square root of X. We have um, taken the derivative, let's, let's take the derivative of this. And we are low on time. So this two, times the square root of X is a constant times a function. The constant is just going to stay put. And now we're going to differentiate the square root of X. We're running a little low on time. So let's go back to where we already did the square root. <coughs> the derivative of the square root is one over twice the square root. Two 
two times one over two cancels. And we get one over the square root. So, so far, differentiation hasn't uh, been, I mean, it's never going to get really bad, but so far, it's these rules have been kind of elementary. Um, tomorrow, we're going to start looking at arithmetic combinations, like if you're adding functions and you're multiplying functions. And some of those rules are going to be kind of unintuitive, but we'll take them slow and we'll try to mask.